welcome everybody. Happy to have you here. We have done pop-up theology for the last two years. This is the first time we're trying it during the spring season. We figure pandemic be darned. We're all sitting in front of a computer anyway, so why not give ourselves something interesting to talk about? Most of you know by now, but I want to remind us about the legacy of Father Neil Conley and the reason that pop-up theology is named after Neil. Um, Neil was a priest we were lucky enough to work with for a couple of years before he retired and went home to God. He was a giant in social justice ministry and in that um, working with the poor in the church. And so through this lecture series, our goal is to facilitate dialogue that interprets the interplay of our faith and the spirit in the modern day life. We've decided to honor Father Neil by dedicating all of our talks and special events to his vision of how Catholic life should be lived by finding Jesus in everything. And a word about our presenter tonight, Dr. Charlie Gillespie. He teaches in the Department of Catholic Studies at Sacred Heart University, where our beloved father Tony comes from. His research and teachings investigate religion, the arts and culture with a focus on the Catholic intellectual tradition, critical philosophies of art and beauty and theater and performance studies. In 2019, he completed his PhD in religious studies at the University of Virginia with a dissertation entitled, Drama Alone is Credible, Hans Urs van Balthasar and the interpretive work, theater and performance in the 20th century, 20th century Christian thought. Charlie holds a BAH in humanities from Villanova University and an MAR in religion and literature from the Yale Institute of Sacred Music and Yale University Divinity School. He served as a catechist for Pope Francis's visit to the Youth Congress of the World Meeting of Families in Philadelphia in 2015, and is a co-founder of the interdenominational liturgical drama troupe, Theatrum Sacrum. Charlie is working on his first book, God on Broadway. He lives in Norwalk, Connecticut with his spouse, Tara Powers. So I am really pleased to present Charlie. I'm really excited to hear what Charlie has to say. All of that academia brings us to somebody who's going to talk to us about God and play and theology. So Charlie, I'm so excited to hear what you're going to share with us tonight. It's all yours. Oh, I forgot to pray. Dear God, God who has a wicked sense of humor, be with us tonight, open our hearts and our minds and let us laugh in your presence. Amen. Amen. Jane, thank you so much for that introduction and to Lydia for all the help with the technical support and getting things going. It's a delight and an honor to be with you all. Whenever I hear my dissertation title read out loud, I recall what one of my mentors, Father Jerry Fogarty said the first time I shared the title of my dissertation, which is, oh wow, I'm still listening to the title and I'm already waiting for it to come out in paperback. Um, so it is an absolute delight to be with you all this evening. Thanks so much for um, taking the time to be with us. So I wanted to talk to you about theology at play, because I think that might be something fun to think about during our time of the pandemic. Um, I am going to share my screen because I have a little PowerPoint, but while we can all still see each other, I hope in gallery view, I wonder if we might risk something. I know you just got all the rules and regulations to keep your hands and arms inside the Zoom at all times uh, while staying muted, but I thought it might be fun just to ask briefly, what's your favorite game to play? So if I might ask, would you mind introducing yourself and just share with us is there a game or something that you enjoy playing? What comes to mind if I ask you, what do you like to play? Nick, why don't you go first? Do you have one that comes to mind? Put me on the spot. Uh, I did. I would, I'd probably go with something athletic, kind of sport related. Um, probably go baseball or softball, if that counts. I know it's off the game path, but. Perfect. 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 Nick's got us started with a game or a sport. Exactly the thing we want to think about when we think about play. It involves sports. Taylor, how about you? Is there a game or a sport or something that comes to mind when I ask you, what do you like to play? Uh, it makes me immediately think of like playing card games that my girlfriend's gotten me into a lot more of over the past few years. So just kind of any playing card games, classic Excellent. games. That is when I think of classic card games, fond memory, something like that. Um, St. Agnes Cathedral, did something come to mind for you if I say, is there anything you enjoy playing? It's, my name's Joe, by the way. Okay. <laughs> I'm the spectator. I like to watch it all Perfect. and share from the sidelines. So there's no particular game. Excellent. 
Excellent. But notice already that Joe has rightfully pointed out to us that play also involves watching in some way. We're going to talk about that a little bit. Joe, how about you? Is there something you enjoy playing or something that comes to mind? Did you say Joan? I, I tried. I may have oh, said it I, I, Was it Joe? No, there were all these guys, so I, I was surprised. Um, I have to say Monopoly. I really mm -hmm. don't play games very much, but because of my grandchildren, Monopoly. But it's striking to me that I don't have a good answer for that question. So Monopoly is an excellent <laughs> answer. Thank you for being here. Um, and thanks to our first three folks that I put on the spot. I don't want to do that to anyone else, but are there other Oh no, it, it's not on the spot. It's not on the spot. I just didn't I just didn't understand. Okay. I don't know. It it seems to me that, you know, uh, everyone is talking about games that involve other people, but I, I, I really like crossword puzzles. So I don't know if that counts or not, but I I really like to do crossword puzzles. Excellent. Would anyone else like to unmute and share something they enjoy playing or what comes to mind? I have a game, but I can't think of the name of it, but it's when you're in teams and you act out a movie or a play and you have- Charades. Charades, thank you very much. That's my favorite game. Excellent. Charades, a wonderful game. I miss playing charades actually myself. Anyone else? I do I like. I do Go ahead, Kristen. Hey. Oh. Oh, nice. And online, online, and Scrabble every sing twice or three times a day. Scrabble, word games, also connecting with folks, realizing that even though there are some games we think we can only play directly in person, we've actually found ways to do it during the pandemic. Kristen, please, is there something that comes to mind about yeah, playing? I like, I, I like Breda, I like word games. I, I like Bananagrams and Boggle, and I love word games. Word cool. games are a lot of fun and also we think of something like word play poets play with words in a certain way and invite us to notice things anew i'm also a bananagrams fan myself anyone else have something that comes to mind when you think of play i like the specific card game um phase 10 because my memory of my of growing up at home is my parents playing cards with their friends and the laughter that was filled the house so i like card games but phase 10 specifically Excellent. Anyone else want to share one? Beautiful. Well, thank you all so much for those great games to get us in mind and also other ways that we like to play. And the reason I wanted to start with that question is precisely because sometimes we might think that play is something we fully understand and know and realize but also it's something that we're so used to, we don't think about that often. And so that's what I wanna invite us to do today. Well, I'm so delighted to be here to talk to you all about the theology at play, but first I just wanna invite us to do some gestures of greeting. We also, we already talked about play a little bit, but take a minute and perhaps just greet someone with a shy little wave, just try it, just try it. Again, just try it out. Or perhaps a high five or an elbow bump or an air hug to someone that's nearby to you or through the Zoom. I'll give you all a nice big air hug now. Or even if you have a signature dance move, now is the time to share it. Just a little movement, a little bit. Perfect, beautiful. And we already talked about this one because I wanted us to see each other when we asked it, but keep in mind, what are all these different ways that we can play together? Today I want to talk to you about the silliness and the seriousness of who I'm describing as a playful God. And what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about what I mean by theology at play. Let us think about how we can be silly and serious in how we think about God. And then perhaps have a conversation inspired by some of the uh, ideas I want to play with a little bit with you all today. But first I just want to give my central claim, the, the thing that I think anchors our whole conversation today. And it's a bold one. And I want to suggest that if theology becomes boring, theology also stops being true. I'm gonna say that again. If theology becomes boring, theology also stops being true. What I mean by that is that I think that when we think about theology, we have a tendency to make it a set of principles 
or ideas, or like a recipe for God. If I know these points of dogma, I can then interpret anything that comes at me and I'll be right, and I can win my argument and I can go home. Or we might think of theology as a way to make mystery domesticated, to take this idea that's so rich and wonderful and profound that we know fills our heart with song, but make it something that we can fit in our pocket. And I know one of the dangers of theology is it becomes a bunch of rules and regulations, and it stops pointing to a divine life of love that we know to be God. And so I want to suggest to you all that I think the theology of play can actually help us investigate this central claim I'm making. But first, we have to get a little clear on what it means to do a theology of something. You all probably have heard this before if you're coming up to pop up theology. I'm not telling you anything new, but I think wordplay is fun. And a number of us shared that we liked word games. So I thought I'd break it down a little bit. The word theology derives from two Greek words, logos, about theos. Think about it. The word logos means a word, an idea, or an organizing principle. And the word theos usually could be translated as God, divinity, or value. So when we think about theology, it's our words and ideas and the way we organize thoughts about God. Now, of course, St. Anselm has a very famous definition of theology. And in Latin, it's fides querens intellectum, but in English, it's this idea of faith seeking understanding. So the first thing I hope that I could suggest to you to help us think about theology at play is to think about theology as a verb, not a set of things that we own, possess, or put in our pocket, but something we do. One of the great founders of liberation theology, and I know that St. Francis de Sales has a strong commitment to doing the work of bringing the kingdom of heaven into the world that we live in today through an encounter with those who are God's beloved, the least of these. One of the founders of liberation theology, Gustavo Gutierrez, once wrote that faith is a grace. Theology is an understanding of this gift. Theology tries to say a word about the mysterious and ineffable reality that we believers call God. It is logos about theos. Someone I study, Hansers von Balthasar, who was a mid 20th century theologian, who was a favorite of Pope St. John Paul II, Benedict XVI, and even Pope Francis, argued that all theology is an interpretation of divine revelation. So what are Gutierrez and von Balthasar getting at with these ideas? I think they're telling us that theology is a human response to God's initiative, because theology is a way of understanding. So if we talk about a theology of something, it's an interpretation of that thing in the light of divine revelation. In other words, a theology of asks, how does faith seek understanding of X in the style of grace and in the light of revelation? So when we turn to a theology of play then, it's an interpretation of what it means to play in the light of what God has shown us. I wonder, not only, can we learn more about play by thinking about it theologically? But I think we can actually learn more about theology by thinking about it playfully. So here's my game plan for today. I have a couple of questions I wanna think about before I throw it open for a conversation with you all. The first is an ethical one. Should theology be playful? Because doesn't play under, undermine the seriousness of holy wisdom? Once we wrestle with this a little bit, we'll be able to ask, well, what actually is play anyway? What is this phenomenon and how do we understand it? If we get a sense of how play works, maybe we can figure out how theology can be playful. And I'll suggest some ways that a playful approach to theology might illuminate things we don't ordinarily see. Finally, I'll turn to some suggestions for what are locations for the fancy phrase theologia ludens or the theology of play by looking at how we might play with scripture, play with the liturgy, play with how we think about Christ or Christology during this Easter season, and finally suggest a way that play might open up how we think about even the mystery of God's triune life. But with that though, my first question, should something as serious as theology be playful? Because play and seriousness kind of go together like fish in a microwave, think about it. If you have something like theology that's illuminating the depth of the reality of the world, should that be something we treat like a pastime or 
like what we want to do to relax? Isn't this the hard work of belief to try to have faith seek understanding? We all know that fish and microwaves do not go together. And I've been told very few commandments in addition to the one God put in the scriptures. But one is that the only kind of fish you can eat in the workplace are either the little goldfish or a Swedish fish. Try not to microwave anything else because it's not pleasant for those involved. And so one threat from play to theology is that we might forget how to be serious about it. Now, think about this for a second. When we go to work, ordinarily we're told we have to sort of hold ourselves in a professional way, how to exist in such a manner that we're not implying that what we do is not super important or very rich and full of meaning. I teach in a Catholic studies department at a university. So when I'm sort of walking around, passing the time, going, not really thinking, kind of dancing around the hallway, my colleagues sort of look at me and go, wow, that, that one's cut from a different sort of cloth but apparently they like me, so it's fine. But what would it mean to bring play to this hard work? And I wanna invite you to try it out with me. So as I put on the PowerPoint, probably sharing this with you already, I'm at my desk preparing these notes in advance and I knew I was gonna be embarrassed by that moment of song and dance. So I hope you might be willing to play along with me too. And if you're trying to figure out how I could have predicted this in the future, you can come to a future pop-up theology talk on Catholic theology and time travel. So what we do right now is we need two volunteers. We will take the first two people who unmute for us. We just need someone to go, I will be player A, and someone to say, I will be player B. Who's willing to do that for us? I'll be player A. Thank you, Kristen. You will be player A. And who will be player B for us? I'll do it. Thank you, Kathleen, you have saved us. As I tell my students, if we wait much longer, we're all gonna be here till the end of time. So Kristen and Kathleen, congratulations. You are our volunteers. I thank you for your service to our community. Kristen, player A, your line is as follows. Are you ready? It's very complicated. Please give me that, I need it. Try that line out. Please give me that, I need it. Now, Kathleen, you also have a line, just one, but it's tricky. Are you ready? It's yes. you can't have it. I need it. You can't have it. I need it. Try it. You can't have it. I need it. Now, Kristen and Kathleen, we'd like to invite you to play this short scene for us a number of times, maybe for about 15 seconds, but you may only use your line back and forth. Try different ways to say it. What are ways to convince the other person to give you this thing that you need? Just bounce it back and forth like you're playing catch. And if one way of saying it doesn't work, play around and try a different one. Kristen, take it away. I need it. Please, may I have it? You can't have it. I need it. I really, really need it, Kathleen. Please, please, Kathleen. You can't have it. I need it. Well, can I have a little of it? Oh, I have to say you it. can't have it. I need it. Okay, well, I will have to re, I'll have to do without, and I guess I can. What a beautiful resolution to that conflict. That was lovely. I've never had that game resolved with resolution immediately before. That was well done. Well, we, I didn't follow the rules. I didn't use the exact wording, sorry. Why would you apologize for playing with the rules of the game? That seems to be exactly what we were hoping would happen. So thank you to Kristen and Kathleen for playing for us. A round of applause that no one will be able to hear because you're following the rules to remain muted. But we're so grateful for that little moment. Exactly, thank you, Good. a round of applause. What do we notice in that little game? Well, the first is that we can play with a theme and a topic and idea that might be extraordinarily important. I don't know what came to your mind when we heard Christian and Kathleen playing with these two little lines, but that could have been a story about someone that needed a bit of food or access to a vehicle to get somewhere important or life-saving medicine. On the other hand, it could have been as simple as someone who just really wanted to be able to watch television with the remote or to flee from this the pop-up theology because it's not quite as funny as you thought it was going to be. And that balance of playing with an idea, even though it's serious, tells us something about play. The relationship between playfulness and seriousness or even silliness and seriousness is not as clear as we think it might be at first. 
I think back to when Nick answered my question right at the beginning about sort of what sort of games come to mind that you might like to play. And the fact of the matter is we use the verb to play for sports all the time. An event where we get completely caught up and involved in this activity that you're, we're doing. Think about it. Professional sports players take their play quite seriously. Yeah. On the other hand, think about a musician or an artist whose job it is with hours upon hours of dedicated practice to play an instrument, to bring beautiful music to life. This very same verb is something that we used to say, I am taking notes written on the page and I'm bringing them into the world. I'm playing this instrument to elicit beauty from it. So we know that when we think about play, it's not necessarily just something that's the opposite of seriousness and importance. It's a way of interacting with the world. So if we're not so concerned about being serious about theology while thinking about play, maybe we do need to figure out what play is itself. I wanna to suggest to you based on some 20th century philosophy and theology, that what play does is present itself for our consideration. Think back to what Joe said right at the beginning of our time together. He doesn't really like to get caught up in the game, but he likes being a spectator and watching it happen. How does that work? Because play gathers a community to watch it. Any form of play in some sense presents itself to an onlooker. What are some of the qualities of that presentation that play makes? I wanna call out three of them. Freedom, materiality or stuff and life. I think these are three key characteristics to play that we can use to think about play theologically. The first one gets you your $10 word for the day, which is that play expresses freedom because it is autotelic. Now, what does that phrase mean? Well, it derives from two Greek words again, auto meaning self, like an automobile, something that is mobile from itself, it's self-driving, and also telos, which is the fancy word for an end, not just the stopping of something, but the purpose or target of an event, action, or being. When something is autotelic, that means that it finds its end in itself. So play freely seeks itself as its own end. Another way to put that is that play has no purpose other than itself. Now we heard a few folks make reference to card games earlier, and I have this image on the slide of a poker game, and you might be thinking wisely, but Charlie, no, 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 no. Play definitely has a purpose. If I'm gonna go play a card game, especially a game of chance where I'm gambling, my purpose is to win money. And my suggestion to you is that's not actually the purpose of the game. That is something we layer on top of the game as another goal. Think about it. If the purpose of a game was just to make money or seek an end, why would there be a difference between playing for fun and playing for keeps. And so what I think we see, even in something as simple as a card game, is that play works by being itself, being wholly involved in what play is playing. It's why we get lost in games all the time. It's part of the fun of playing a game of Monopoly. You get so invested in these small bits of cardboard but you know, it, it really does hurt a little bit when you have to mortgage that boardwalk you work so hard to purchase, doesn't it? But it's not the same as if you were foreclosed on your house because the game isn't about investing in property. It's about sharing in something beautiful and joyful. It's about finding its end in itself. Another aspect to play is that it needs materiality or stuff. You need to play with something. Now, you might, of course, object immediately and say, oh, no, but I can sort of fidget or play with my hands or, or, or think to myself and play in my imagination. And I want to suggest to you that you needed a body in order to do any of those things, because play doesn't exist out in the world as some object we can go find or purchase at Costco. Play is something that emerges in an event 
between things that are relating. One of the key ways that play does that, according to the anthropologist Johann Heutzinger, is because play establishes boundaries and changes the rules of ordinary life. Now, I found this wonderful image of a field on the side of a hill. I think it's usually used to display something like the need for an even playing field, but I think it's kind of playful and fun. But it points out something about play we already know. When we play a game, we establish the boundaries and rules of the field that are different from ordinary life. Think about it. If you pass a goal post in your ordinary walk down the street, you're not going to think to yourself, oh, look, I could score a goal right now. What you would need is the game to establish that meaning for this structure that's a net and some poles. What play does is invest the world with different meaning from what it ordinarily has but that's because play needs stuff in order to play with. One last thing. I found this little gif of a cat running and I think it's just delightful, but we also play with things and bring them to life. This is a little tricky, but if you think about it, it makes sense. Play brings both movement and merriment. The basic structure to play that we've known since the time of ancient Greek philosophers is the movement of something sort of back and forth for no particular reason. Remember, play seeks its own end. So when we're playing with something like a pen or a coin in our hand, that sort of movement back and forth gives it a new kind of life, sort of like the delight of watching these two elephants play on a seesaw. But the other thing about play is that it brings a delight to us because we get to see life in the world. Another way to think about it is, who would you describe as the life of the party? Someone who's playful and making it an enjoyable time. This is one of the ways that play works in the language of the theater and performance. Think about how actors play in theater or on screen. They make choices and act in such a way that's different from their ordinary way of being, but they tell a story and bring new life for us to look at. So these are the three characteristics of play I think are important for us if we're gonna play with play theologically. Play is about freedom because it seeks its own end. That's that fancy word, autotelic. Play requires material, including a body, in order to play with it because we can't go find play out in the world or on the shelf at a store. And play brings life, both in terms of movement and in terms of merriment. So, I want to play a little game with you. This might be tricky and I won't put anyone on the spot this time because I was cruel and unusual at the beginning of this experience. But I want to invite you, if you can, without going too far from where you are, find any prop, any object that you might be able to play with. But the way we're going to play is to ask you to interpret it differently. So how can you find any object that's near you that, so we get the material, and do something with it so we can notice both freedom, it's not being used in its ordinary sense as a tool, and so that we see the life in it, both movement and perhaps even some merriment. See if you can find anything that would work for this game. Does anyone have a prop? Right, I see Alice has a few people have one. So if you'd like, why don't you unmute for us? and then play with this object for just a moment with some movement and merriment. But remember, the Zoom gods require that you make a little bit of sound or you won't light up with the magic halo, so we'll be able to see you. So Jane, are you going first? Was that me, Jane? Yes. Okay. Tequila. <laughs> <laughs> Beautifully done. Alice, I think you're next. Or a votive. Or a votive, lovely. Um, oh. I think I see Captain Hook in this alligator. <laughs> Beautiful. Does anyone else have a prop they're going to play with for us? I have a flashlight so I can see you better. It's <laughs> great. <laughs> like people like to do it Halloween, you know, like the feels dark in the room. I guess it'd have more effect. <laughs> no, that's perfect. I, I feel the light shining on me from here. There we go. The halo that's thing. Oh, beautiful. Kristen, what do you have for us? Oh, this, I don't know if you can see it. Um, it, it I went to get, do an Easter basket for my nephew, and it was the week after uh, 
Jewish holidays, and, and as you know, frogs are big in the, uh, in the Seder, et cetera. So I forgot to give it to him, but I'm using it now because I have to get off soon and do something I don't want to do. I'm using it as a stress releaser. So I'm <laughs> going like that. And I find that it, I did it earlier today. So I cheated, I guess, but this is great. So it's a frog that I've turned into a, a, a nice um, tactile, maneuverable something that makes me relax. Very good. Lydia, do you have a, a prop to share with us? I do. It's my friend, Bobblehead Pope Francis. <laughs> <laughs> that, now, that's just spectacular. If, if you get nothing else out of theology, please know that it's fully endorsed by the Holy Roman Pontiff himself. Notice him nodding along with the whole talk. That's perfect. Anyone else have a prop for us? Oh, Joan, what do you have there? A pen. You must pay the rent. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Marvel. Perfect. Nice one. <laughs> Very well done. Anyone else have a prop they'd like to share? I'm on my computer, uh, on the other computer. Oh, very good. And I'm looking up some Facebook stuff. Oh, excellent. The, the proverbial book of faces where just constantly getting to see windows into people's lives. That's, that's lovely. Anyone else have a prop for us? This is great. I brought a spackle knife uh, that I occasionally think about as a trumpet, but there are different ways to think about how we use these objects. Thanks so much for playing along for those of you who shared a prop with us. But look, I'm sure there's at least one person sitting here going, we're about 35 minutes into this man and I'm, and I'm still not entirely sure how any of this relates to theology. So I wanna make a few suggestions to you before I throw it open for some Q and A. There are three areas where I think that there are direct theological applications of the way we've thought about play together. Theater as an analogy, play and prayer, and thinking about a playful God. First, theatrical analogies. We all know the great image of the theatramundi metaphor from Shakespeare, who's celebrating a birthday tomorrow, I will have you know. And it derives most famously from those lines from As You Like It, where Jaquie says, all the world's a stage and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances and one man in his lifetime plays many parts. Now, how does this relate to theology? Think about it. If the whole world is a stage, to whom is this globe playing? There's an idea that stretches from the early church fathers to the present that we might think about our life on earth as a kind of play for and with God. But notice what that means, not in the ancient Greek sense, where the world is performing for the God's enjoyment, but in Christianity and salvation history, and notice that God decides to become a player alongside each one of us, to join us in our struggles and our triumphs in the incarnation. When we think about playing in terms of the theater, making choices, discovering new things, exploring the freedom of joy and laughter, playing with objects in new ways, it actually gives us a little bit of insight into what it means to live in a world that in Gerard Manley Hopkins' phrase is charged with the grandeur of God. There's theological possibility around every corner, just like how in a theater, something as simple as a pen can become a mustache, making us all afraid about the fact that we might be late on our rent this month. That might just have been me. But you have to think of prayer as playful or play as a prayerful activity? Think about what we've talked about. Prayer can also be autotelic and life-giving. Sure, we have a long practice and tradition in the Catholic intellectual tradition of supplicatory prayer or prayers that ask God for something specific. But if we reduce our prayer lives to just asking God for the next thing we need, we've actually missed out on a chance of deepening our relationship with the divine. Prayer can also be a way of connecting us with the mystery at the heart of the world. 
And one of the ways we can do that is to think about our play as prayerful. What would it mean to think about that which makes us feel most alive, most full of joy, most laughing from the bottom of our belly? as a prayer to God and thanksgiving for the goodness of the world. Because just like playing a sport or an instrument that takes our full concentration, our full sense of being alive, prayer also invites us to involve our whole person. That brings me to the great Hugo Rahner, who was a member of the Society of Jesus. Hugo Rahner was brothers to Karl Rahner, who was a famous 20th century theologian you may have heard of before. There were actually three Rahner brothers who all considered entering the priesthood, and they were ranked in order of their theological promise. The most popular and well-known, Karl, was actually considered to be the least creative and interesting. His brother, Hugo, was in the middle. He also wrote a couple of books, but they're nowhere near as famous as Karl's. And the third brother, considered by their teachers to be the best theological mind, became a mailman. But there's a great quote from Hugo Rahner in his book, Man at Play, that I wanted to share with you to think about a playful God. Surely, only a person whose foundation is the reality of God can thus call life on earth a game and a shadow play. For only to such a person as this, only to a person who truly believes that this world has proceeded out of the fullness of God's created being, can accept and lovingly embrace the world, which includes themselves as God's handiwork, and at the same time, toss it aside as a child would toss a toy of which it is wearied, in order then to soar upward into the blessed seriousness, which is God alone. Love for the world and rejection of the world, both of these must draw them and they must at one and the same moment be ready to fold that world in God's embrace and to turn one's back upon it. Think about what Hugo Rahner is saying here. It's a complicated quote, but it points out something wonderful when we think theologically about play. When we're playful with the world, we both hold it to be wonderful and important, much like the way a child would love a favorite toy that they play with on a regular basis but we also learn to treat the world for what it is, something that we can't cling to and obsess about, or we'll make idols out of those beloved creations and hold them to be more important than our relationship with God in God's self. I think play then is a signal to both those we love, whom we love, and what we love, that we love them. But how might we think about God as playful? Well, thinking about God's kindergarten transcript, if God is perfect, surely God will play well with others. But we can press this a step further. A theology of play can give us new insight into a quite traditional and orthodox Catholic understanding of God's create relationship to creation. One, God creates the material of the world out of nothing. That fancy term, ex nihilo, you've probably heard before. When God creates the entire cosmos, it is not out of things that were there before God decided to love the world into being. It's God's decision to create. God creates out of love and freedom. This is a truism of theology. God doesn't need the world to be God, but the world certainly needs God to be the world. And finally, we know from scripture that God's creative activity gives the gift of life, much like play. This act of love towards creation enlivens it, both as a source of our movement, the God who lives and moves and empowers our being, but also our merriment, the idea of God as our final end and perfect joy. So I wanna give four suggestions briefly and then we'll have some time for conversation. The first is, are there ways to think about how we play with scripture? One way I might invite you to think anew about the theology of play is to think about art as a playful interpretation of what is going on in these words. Think about images of creation and how they play with the ideas of scripture, but also might push us in new directions. We tend to limit creation to certain artistic images we're used to, like the famous creation of Adam from the roof of the Sistine Chapel. But what might be different if we thought about creation as something cosmic or inclusive, something that sees all seven days of creation as one profound moment, like this illumination from the St. John's Bible? 
One way to think about playing with scripture might be how we make art out of it, whether that's theater, music, or visual art. Another way to think about play is how we see the elements of the liturgy. If you think about my own image of Pope Francis here, the to and fro of incense as a playful application. We don't use it in the liturgy as a way to make it smell good because the Middle Ages did not have our HVAC technologies anymore, but instead it elevates both our sensory experience and the beauty of the moment. We can also think about the ways that liturgical actions like the elevation of the bread and wine in the midst of the Holy Mass might be a kind of illumination of these created objects in the light of divine revelation. What would it mean to think about this time when we gather as the body of Christ to receive the body of Christ, be a way of God's willingness to play with and through us? I also think about the playfulness of the risen Christ in this Easter season. Think about it for a minute. When Christ first appears arisen to the women at the tomb, Mary Magdalene mistakes Jesus for a gardener. There's also a wonderful story of Jesus' friends who clearly knew him well, walking to Emmaus and not recognizing Jesus again until the breaking of the bread. We often read this as a failure on the part of the disciples to recognize the Jesus they knew. But what if we think about Jesus as a bit of a trickster, reminding us that in the moment of resurrection, it's not simply a coming back from the dead to an ordinary return to life, but a chance to celebrate delight and have fun with it, a chance to surprise someone with something that could never be expected. The image to the right is a really striking and beautiful painting of the road to Emmaus. On the left, the mosaic behind the altar at Sacred Heart University, a playful engagement with the image of the resurrection, with Jesus harrowing hell and lifting up Adam and Eve, but also visiting with the disciples in the upper room. If you count them closely, you'll notice Doubting Thomas cut class that day, and that's one of the reasons he had some trouble recognizing Jesus. Finally, I want to suggest that the theology of play can actually help us think about God's triune life the eternal dance of God, the Father's love for God the Son, who together their love spirates the Holy Spirit. How might we think about play as a way to imagine eternal life, not as something that would ever become dull or ordinary or predictable, but as an unending opportunity to be fully engrossed in God's love, a chance to have the rest and joy of play for all eternity because, well, what have we learned from our faith, if not that God is love, and that love is worth paying attention to? Does anyone have any questions or comments or thoughts or reflections? I got a, a thought that came to me in, at the beginning because uh, we can do this now, but you know, there was a time someone like you, especially trying to do or pass along the thought of the playfulness of God with what was always such a solemn and serious thing, you'd have been a heretic. You know, mm -hmm. you'd have been brought up on charges of heresy and a blasphemer. Um, so uh, perhaps somewhere in, in your own studies, when and how and where did this begin to be okay? That is such an excellent question. So on the one hand, I think it's always been okay. If play is a kind of interpretation, the church has been doing it since the first days of the Christian community. On the other hand, if we think only about play as a mocking or perceiving ourselves as superior to something else, it's a way we talk about play all the time, right? You're playing at this. You don't actually know what you're doing. That's a kind of blasphemy, one that mocks or derides. I think one of the reasons the church for so long was so anxious about embracing a playful account of God is because there was a desire to shore up God's authority and importance and majesty. And it's a relatively modern sensibility in the sense of since the 20th century to think about play as something that dignifies. The shortest way to answer this great question is to think about our basic understanding of history. Professional sports were not considered to be an important contribution to culture until the last 100 to 150 years. It would only make sense then that if we're extending play as a theological tool, it would track along with the same period. 
Last comment I would make about this, which I think is really a brilliant question, is thinking about God as playful might actually be an extension of the pastoral vision of the Second Vatican Council. If we think about theology as a set of principles, so we don't get God wrong, a Tridentin sensibility, what we do with theology is interpret God correctly rather than incorrectly. Play is a different approach. It's one to see how is how God is manifesting in our everyday lives. And I think that's something that is a more recent but not unique way of thinking about it. Great question. I'm almost hoping that Baby Barr has something to add to the conversation since he's the probably the best player in the group. Me too. Hi, Anne. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I will ask uh, just a general question. Um, just, I, I guess, with regard to play, it seems to me that there's definitely some aspects of the Old Testament where God has, you know, it, um, or in the, it's been interpreted that God has been either harsh or God has been, you know, asking for, for things like, you know, Abraham's son or things like that. And so I guess how or what comments would you have on just God as both a playful in the Old Testament versus the New Testament, or if you have any thoughts on that. That's such an important question because wow. I think there are two reactions I've had, and I'd love to hear other folks' thoughts on this. The first is when I think about play and the Old Testament, what immediately comes to mind are the prophets, where one of the strategies of prophecy to show when God is displeased with how humans are living is actually to play with materials in a new way. If you ever want to be shocked, go and look at the book of Ezekiel, where one of the prophetic strategies is to do utterly absurd things to point out the utterly absurd way of life of a community that's no longer in covenant with God. Another way to think about it is play is an angle on how we interpret the divine. And the Hebrew Bible reveals for us also ways to think about God's majesty and authority and importance. And if our tendency is to think that play makes us superior to the one who is playing, then reading the Old Testament might be a reminder that that's not the best way to think about God. There's a marvelous moment in the book of Job that I'm quite a fan of, where uh, the critique of God's way of relating to the world is to say, why are you letting all this suffering happen? And God responds, well, were you there when I created things? Speaking out of a whirlwind. I sometimes think to myself, certainly the most obvious way to stage that scene in a movie is to make it utterly terrifying and scary. The next way I think about it though is, well, to talk out of a whirlwind and to say, were you there from the beginning is also kind of a playful, sarcastic response. And there might be some ways to read the Old Testament differently from a wrathful, angry God but rather as a God who's trying to tell us that sometimes ways of living together aren't best. Well, I, I'm, I'm often struck by, you know, by things that are very funny. Mm -hmm. And of course, as an old time, you know, Catholic, I know the New Testament a lot better than I know the Old Testament. But I, I just think this, the part in the woman at the well, where Jesus says to her, um, you know, something about your husband. It's, it's like, it's like, you know, it's like Shecky Green or something. I mean, it's, it's, it's like a comedy club. Oh no, you have me confused with someone else. I have no husband. Oh yeah, you do. Uh, I mean, that is just funny. That is a very funny thing. And how, you know, how you can read it any other way. You know, it's Jesus, you know, he knew he, she had a husband. So, uh, you know, there's just a lot of that going on, certainly in the New Testament. And I'm intrigued to find out there's a lot of that in the Old Testament as well. <laughs> Your uh, answer two questions ago made me think of history, first of all, but also court jesters back in medieval times, because not only are they very theatrical, but when I've learned more about them, their whole role was to act absurdly in order to make light of what was sovereign. And then, and I always thought that that was like making fun of what was sovereign, but really it's actually maintaining its authority, but making it more approachable for the common folk. And so, because my question coming into this, into your talk, was about how can we have the playfulness and seriousness at the same time? Or is that just another duality of the universe? And so it, and as, as you were sharing, it just seems like that playfulness makes it more approachable without threatening the authority. I think that's a really great point. And it connects to Alice's so well. Um, there's a long tradition of seeing the resurrected Jesus as a kind of holy fool 
there's a tradition that sees this idea that death is laughable in the face of the resurrection. Um, it's, it's sort of an interesting way to think anew about what we talk about in this Easter, Easter season. Can you tell I have a liturgical calendar sensibility? But if we think about the way we think about the resurrection in our ordinary lives, what is the light of the Paschal candle, if not a reminder that death, while scary and important, and we can't pretend that it doesn't fill us with sorrow, we can't pretend that resurrection doesn't have wounds. It also doesn't get the last word. And perhaps there's something about resurrection that lets us think about an eternity where we might be laughing rather than weeping. Just curious, you give this in a classroom with young people. What is that like and how do they take this? Are, are they, because we're a different group than what you would usually be do, doing this for. I, I'm just really interested in what, what, what are the differences between us and the kids? That, I'm 81, a, so, you know. <laughs> well, <laughs> it sounds to me like, uh, <laughs> well, so three, that's a great question, Joan. Um, I think there's two big differences. I think the first is we got to do this in a playful way that I have to work really hard to try to trick my students into thinking the classroom is. Because most of my students, at least, come into my classes in the Catholic intellectual tradition as a required seminar for graduation. I want them to fall deeply in love with the world and with the, with the God that has created it. But sometimes my matchmaking doesn't always work as well as I want it to. Um, so the big difference here is we've already embraced doing something autotelically. You're not here because you needed to be. You're here to delight in spending time together and hopefully perhaps think a new thought and hopefully I was not too much of a waste of your time. The second way that this group is different from my students is you've been what I would say bit by the theology bug. You've developed a love of deepening your way of thinking about God by continuing to wrestle with it. My students come at it from the other perspective. They've never cracked open the mystery of God because they're either too afraid that it will hurt their faith and that's something they cherish and value. So there's a lot of fear or they couldn't be bothered because they're so thoroughly convinced that God has nothing to say to the world and their life today. And by being playful in the classroom and opening up ideas and art and music, I hopefully invite my students to think about God a little differently. For the record, I would much rather hang out with the, as many 81-year-olds as I possibly could rather than college-age students, but I've been told I have an old soul. <laughs> I know we're almost out of time, so is there anyone else with a burning comment or important question or key intervention or, I don't know, a restaurant recommendation that we all should hear before the end of the night? I think just on a personal note, um, I think somewhere in all of what you said, we were talking about laughter and um, so the Old Testament reference of Isaac's name being laughter and what a divine joke on, you know, God on Sarah. You reminded me tonight what a gift laughter is and how much, how much joy is in that and God is in that. I think Jane makes a beautiful, true comment that laughter is one of the ways that we see God in our lives and feel God in our bodies, right? Ruach, the Hebrew word for breath is also the word for spirit. And when we laugh, we encounter our breath in a different way. It's a way of being embodied, but so rich and wonderful and beautiful. Um, and I think there's something about laughter that lets us notice God together. We all wanna thank Charlie for a delightful uh, hour together tonight. Um, oh, yes. Thinking about laughter and God and play and joy. Um, I hope that Charlie, it's been wonderful. And I'm so glad in all of this that we've gotten to know you a little bit. You're always welcome at St. Francis, and Lydia has given me my closing script. So, if you enjoyed tonight, join <laughs> us on Thursday, May 20th at 7 o'clock for our next pop-up theology when we continue our collaboration with Sacred Heart University with Professor Daniel Rober, who will talk with us about 10 punching bags, an extraordinary artwork by Jean Miguel Basquiat and Andy Warhol. We will examine how their works were informed by pop, hip-hop, and the Catholic imagination and how their art can help us reflect on the Paschal mystery this Easter season. You can see we've taken a turn in pop-up theology and we're <laughs> going for the little bit more lighthearted places. If you like this type of content and want to see more like it, 
please consider making a donation to St. Francis de Sales. You can make a general donation by clicking the give button at the top right hand of our homepage. Love you all. Good night. Wonderful. Thank you. So Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you all. Have a great well, night. Thank you.